Welcome to the dawn. You have just accessed the Purple Knights podcast experience. To begin, please press come. of the Purple Knights podcast. Of course, last episode we had the great party facilitator and DJ Mr. Alfonso Starr on the show. And on that episode, we name dropped a lot of uh, very cool, very special people. And one of them uh, joins me here tonight. I'm talking about Mr. Martin Kember. How are you doing, Martin? Man, I am well, Chris. How you doing? I'm doing I'm doing great. I'm so uh honored to have you here and be able to talk to you about music and about Prince uh specifically and you're one of the best uh falsetto singers I've had the pleasure of hearing live. Thank uh, you, sir. <laughs> so um yeah, I just wanted to say that you're enormously talented. Uh, my sister Paula, who actually got me into Prince, Paula. Follow, follows you very, very faithfully on Facebook and uh, comments and likes a lot of your posts and videos and things like that. So she thinks the world of you, and I do as well. I appreciate that. So, <laughs> hey, Paula, uh, how you doing? <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Paula. Mm-hmm. Yeah, shout out to Paula. Well, where should we get started? I mean, how did you how did you get into music? How did you get into singing? Uh, what really inspired you, and how did that all um, come together in your life? Well, um, I have to say that my mother was an opera singer, and um, we grew up around music and uh, I was just one of those kids that loved radio in particular so I would listen to radio you know um constantly I'd go to school come home first thing I'd do is play my records or turn on the radio to see if I could hear something new that would you know excite me so um uh you know I would always uh sing along you know I'd learn the songs and sing along in uh You know, it wasn't too long as a little kid before my mom realized that, hey, I could actually carry a tune. And she, you know, taught me a lot of things like, uh, you know, pitch and and breath control um, in the early days. And I I still sometimes when I'm performing, you know, as a little kid, my mom would invite her friends over and have me sing. And um, I'd see her in the back of the room, you know, like conducting me and mouthing the lyrics and, uh, you know, just cheering me on and uh, giving me that confidence. And uh, so shout out to my mom. She was really the one that, uh, you know, gave me the confidence to do it. And, uh, you know, I uh, luckily inherited some of her, uh, some of her skill and um, the rest is history. Yeah. I was going to say, there's a little bit of genetics involved there. That's very cool. So, yeah. Yeah, it's great to have family around you as a support system to sort of lift you up and guide you and inspire you in that way. So I I def- deeply resonate with that aspect of your story. And um so when did you when did you have sort of have an idea that singing was something that you wanted to do professionally? Um, Well, by the time I was 10, um, my sisters had joined in and we would sing in the kind of three part harmony. And um, before too long, we we used to do some shows and we got a job on a uh, small, um, almost like a paddle steamer when we lived back east and in the Midwest. and uh, we were the entertainment. So the band would come out and then we would come out and sing with the band. And I was only, you know, probably 10, maybe maybe as old as 12. And um, 
you know, I, I just loved performing and always loved singing. And uh, like I said, I was one of those kids that could not turn off the radio. And I used to go and mow lawns, you know, wash neighbors' cars so I could go buy, you know, the latest album that I wanted, <laughs> you know. So it was just my always my passion. And then, uh, you know, it, but it always kind of seemed like, honestly, like that elusive dream that, oh, let really doesn't happen to people like you know success that's only for stars you know i'm not a star i'm just a guy who loves music right and um so um during high school i kind of got away from it a little bit but let me just back up though because when i was in junior high school um i used to dj a club so i was only like 15 the club was 16 and up right and so I used to DJ a club called the Ozone in Northridge, California on Friday nights. And um, I wasn't even old enough to get in, but uh, you know. <laughs> um, but then, you know, back in, in, in my time, man, we'd play all the fun dance music, but then when it got time, you know, to maybe get a little closer to that girl you'd been dancing with, we'd break it down and play the slow jams. And that's when I'd grab the mic and, you know, sing songs like Reasons by Earth, Wind & Fire and, uh, things like that to Isley Brothers and, you know, <laughs> um, we'd have a great time. And then, you know, during high school, I got away from it a little bit. And I was so focused on DJing because it was still like, oh, OK, I can do this um, and use music to entertain people and get paid for it. And so I, I got away from um, performing a little bit. But then the bug kind of hit me again. And um, before too long, I. Um, I, uh, with two of my best friends um, from high school, um, Sean Harris and Jeff Gill, um, we formed a group called As One. And um, I cut some demos and, you know, would work all week and record on the weekends, you know, to with whatever money I could save up to buy studio time. And uh, we cut a demo and uh, before too long, um, we uh, got a record deal. Uh, a gentleman by the name of L.A. Dre from the N.W.A. camp um, became a member of our group and a keyboard player of our band. And um, we were offered a, a record deal. And uh, we did our first album called As One, A-Z-1. Um, and we, uh, not too long after that, were uh, traveling, um, promoting our album. Um, we had a top, the, our first single, broke top 40 a song called trust in me and it was kind of uh you know during the height of the new jack era um and uh you know it was just a dream come true because now you know i'm with my best friends and we're traveling on this promotional tour having the time of our lives and uh going around to new york and you know the east coast and the west coast and just singing our songs and 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 playing our music and you know, having a lot of fun, I must say, maybe a little too fun, <laughs> too much fun. Um, but uh, yeah, time of my life, man. And that's how it really got started um, for me. And, uh, you know, then um, after that, um, after the group kind of, um, we had our, our uh, good success with our first album. Uh, Jeff Gill was in radio. He was a DJ and became was offered the program director position at Stevie Wonder's radio station, KJLH in Los Angeles. And so he kind of segued a little bit more away from the band. Um, and uh, then I started uh, not long after that recording some um, music and writing some music for a solo project. Before too long, um, I was able to get a publishing deal as a songwriter. And then the publisher uh, submitted some of those songs to Warner Brothers, and I ended up uh, signing a deal with with Warner Brothers as a solo artist. And that's where my One Shade of Love album came from. And, um, you know, that was another just a fantastic time. Now we're doing it, you know, with a big budget and in the big studios in L.A. and, you know, hiring some of the greats to come and play on the album. And, uh, you know, it's just always just been a passion of mine to create music and to to sing and to play and, and, and perform. So how did things sort of progress then after your first, after your first solo record? Um, after my first solo record, again, that was on Warner Brothers. So, you know, that's, that was the dream label for me, um, you know, being a, 
a Prince fan. And it was kind of a concept record in a way. Um, it was very romantic, very mid-tempo and, and ballad heavy, you know, because, you know, large, for the most part, I'm, I excel at writing love songs, you know, especially melody driven um, love songs, you know, but there's another side to me that likes to get funky too, but that was not <laughs> part of the, the direct for that album. Um, but, you know, for me, um, it was a fantastic experience, but it was also a heartbreak because like so many uh, artists who uh, have these stories um, literally right before my album was about to be released, the um, senior VP of a &R who had signed me and he was coming off a platinum Grammy winning album with his debut artist named Paula Cole, which many people may remember. Um, all of a sudden he was gone from the label. There was kind of a uh, power struggle and he ended up on the wrong side of it. So there I was at the label without anybody to champion my project. And um they dribbled it out with literally no promotion at uh, whatsoever. I mean, they just, I had a guaranteed release contract, a, a clause in my contract. And um, they kind of dribbled out, you know, a few thousand copies, but put no money behind it because, you know, it's very political at, at the labels at that time. My, my guy was gone. So n nobody else is going to step in and pick up his project and, you know, spend their budgets on it. They're, they've got their own artists. So, um, I kind of was abandoned at the label and um, uh, the uh, the uh, songs on that album. Uh, well, first of all, that album itself, just from being associated with Warner Brothers and being distributed worldwide, it kind of found its own cult following. Um, and, um, you know, it, uh, it it developed its own kind of organic core audience. Um, and uh, you know, one of the songs kind of started to get played on radio a little bit um, without any promotion. And so it kind of created a, a core audience for me. Um, and then once I was negotiated my release from that label, um, a lot of the songs on there, I ended up um, shopping and placing with other artists like Kenny Lattimore recorded uh, my song, Who? Um, from that album that was on his album called Weekend and that did well for him and then uh, my first gold album was a or gold song that I wrote was a song called When Your Spirit Gets Weak which was also on my One Shade of Love album but it was recorded by a group a, a uh, Christian boy band called Plus One and they went gold with it they had the label behind them they had the budgets you know and um, it, they went gold with it so that was my first uh, gold um success um as a songwriter anyway and then um you know alongside of that i was also writing and recording and producing and uh you know not too long after that i recorded uh an album called cycles which i said this time i don't need a label right i've, I've got my fans i'm just going to serve my fans with with some new music and i recorded this album called cycles um, with a great friend of mine, and I was in, living in Chicago at the time, uh, Emil Gantos. Um, and uh, Emil um, is a fantastic writer and producer. He's written the last uh, huge hits for Charlie Wilson. Um, shout out to Emil um, and Eric, uh, the Insomniacs. We wrote a bunch of stuff together. And um, also a good friend of mine who I call my cousin. He's not really my blood cousin, but I call him my cousin, Reese Nicholas out of the UK, who's a very successful writer producer. We met on MySpace and started writing music over, uh, you know, sharing music and, and writing stuff on, on MySpace. So he um, contributed to that album quite a bit too. Um, and uh, then came this call. Um, well, let me just back up a little bit. I was always really close with the guys from All for One, you know, the group All for One. Yep. I swear by the yep. moon and the stars and the sky. It's Grammy yep. award winning. So I was those I, I was writing a writing partner with Jamie Jones from All for One for a long time also. We wrote a lot of great stuff. He and I and and, and Jason Pennock. Um and um All for One actually went out on a tour with Color Me Bad. Um 
And uh, I guess there was a lot of problems on the tour from what I heard, because one of the members, um, you know, I'll keep names out of my mouth, um, <laughs> but one of the members had, you know, some problems um, with uh, substance abuse and addiction where he was not able to fulfill um, what they had started and what they built. And uh, they were on tour with uh, Jamie Jones at the time. And I got a call from well, Jamie Jones and all for one, I should say. And I got a call from Jamie said, hey, man, um, Color Me Bad's looking for a singer. <laughs> They're looking for somebody to join the band. Um, you know, would you be interested? I'm like, yeah. He's like, we've got this big tour planned. We've got, you know, all of this stuff happening. And, uh, you know, so and they had heard my Cycles album. The members of the other members of Color Me Bad had heard my Cycles album, particularly Kevin K.T. Thornton, um, great guy, man, fantastic, good friend of mine, a great talent, fantastic talent. Um, and particularly, you know, Kevin thought that I'd be a great fit with the band. And they flew out to Chicago. They came to my studio in Chicago kind of to audition me. And, you know, I'm a music lover. I'm a music fan first. So um, I did my homework. <laughs> I'd looked at all of their um, uh, performances where they maybe performed at the halftime show at a basketball game and the things that they sung a cappella. And when they came, you know, to hear me sing, um, I was ready. And instantly, you know, I knew where to be harmony wise and uh, we just clicked. And, um, you know, it was just, uh, you know, those a, a magic kind of thing um and before too long believe it or not um the first performance i did with them um i uh it was at uh in atlantic city at what used to be i think it was the trump casino or the trump hotel and casino at the time um <laughs> he was just a celebrity at that point not a future and ex president and what have you um but uh in front of 5,000 people. And, um, you know, that there was a 5,000 capacity. It was sold out. And um, that was my first performance with uh, with Color Me Bad. And uh, it just felt great. And people really didn't seem to know or care that I was not the original singer. They just loved the songs and my ability to um, perform those songs and to sing those songs you know, um, I think, you know, take me through. And then we did a, a great tour. Um, and uh, I got to tour the world singing, you know, those songs. And when I was on tour with Color Me Bad, knowing my passion for Prince, you know, when it came time, they'd let me uh, uh, do a solo number and I'd always do a Prince song. I, I could have done one of my songs, but I'd always do a Prince song. So I'd like, do like Do Me Baby or How Come You Don't Call Me or something like that uh, while we were on tour all over the world, man. Malaysia, Indonesia, East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, you name it. And I just I just had a great time and it was a wonderful experience. And then um, to uh, do the um, fast forward to um, 2014, we did the BET Awards and did a throwback section. It was Color Me Bad, Silk, and uh, Troop as a throwback section in 2014. So that was a that was a great time. So shout out to Kevin for uh, you know his friendship and for his talent and for uh, you know uh, really being the uh, the one who um, reached out and, and gave me the opportunity to uh, to be a part of Color Me Bad. So we mm. we're coming up on the anniversary of. Uh, Prince's passing, April 21st. And, yes. uh, you know, it's always a kind of a, a, a bittersweet time, um, you know, because um, being such a huge Prince fan, um, when he was suddenly no longer of this earth, um, it was a shock to all of us. So that, though, that first year in particular, that first anniversary april 21st i was in minneapolis there at at first avenue and the revolution and a lot of the people um from all the different aspects of prince's career had that 
reunion. Uh, it was an emotional night. Um, yep. But, uh, you know, I always um, think about the interview that he had with Mel B. Um, and she asked him about birthdays and, um, you know, his response um, was largely, no, I, I don't really celebrate birthdays, but, you know, the day when uh, I ascend, then that might be a time to, to celebrate. So, you know, now it's a weird thing because I don't want to confuse celebrating with his departure from this state of uh life anyway this right state of life but at the same time um to we uh we love to pay tribute to him and his music and his legacy um on that day and i don't think that uh you know i feel in my heart of hearts just based on things that i've heard him say that he would uh he would frown upon upon that based on his beliefs and uh you know where he is now um we're still here and we still uh we still love him and we still love his music and um you know he brought so many of us together so we will be celebrating his life his legacy and his music here in los angeles at a club called the venice west in venice california on the anniversary of his passing um april 21st and Alfonso Starr will be there, uh, and uh, I will have my band, uh, The Unit, there that night, which uh, everybody knows how much I, I love that band. Uh, Stacey Lamont mm -hmm. drums, who is the uh, um, drummer for the Jacksons and Layla Hathaway, and um, wow, so many more. Yeah, he's he's a he's. Woo. And then Kyle, uh, Kyle Bolden will be on guitar that night. He also plays guitar with Stevie Wonder and the Jacksons and many others. He just got came back from a tour with Corrine mm -hmm. Bailey Ray. Um, he's just ridiculously talented. We'll have uh, Romel on bass that night. Romel is a fantastic bass player and guitar player. And I just have to say that the last time I, I played at the Venice West, we had my great friend um, and a fantastic bass player John Stewart um and that was last September um and John um has also passed away um in a very unexpected um car crash um the end of towards the end of last year so this will be the first time we're we're playing without John uh, I know Rom Rommel will come in and you know do a fantastic job because he's so talented but I'm also dedicating this night to uh to john stewart our, our our bass player um we'll also have the great myron mckinley on keys now if if you don't know myron mckinley please google him he is earth wind of fire's music director and he is a uh keyboard player that uh like few that you've ever heard um and he'll be uh on uh playing roads and electric piano that night um we'll have paul on synthesizer and my boy Reggie on saxophone and um, some beautiful background vocalists who will uh, not only sing background, but sing some leads too. And of course, Alfonso Starr, you know, getting the party started. So if you're in the Los Angeles area, definitely come out to the Venice West on uh, April the 21st. And, you know, we're gonna celebrate Prince that night and uh, have a great time and uh, just enjoy his music together as, as a Purple family anybody in the area you know you gotta yeah. you gotta check these guys out they're incredible they're a force to be reckoned with so <laughs> and, you uh, saw the unit at the poorhouse so you know what i'm talking yes, about yes yeah <laughs> and uh respect and love and peace to to john stewart thank um, you appreciate that yes um we we miss john it's always it's always unfortunate, you know, I've been talking to friends recently, you know, all the, all the greats, you know, as you get older, all the greats, you know, seem to be leaving, leaving us, you know, more and more at a, yeah. at, a at a faster rate. It seems, it seems yeah. to, to be accelerated the last, you know, right, tw Chris. 20 years or so. So you're um, right, Chris. The lesson to be learned there is give people their flowers while they're still here. 
And that's um, just one of the many reasons why I do the podcast and uh, get connected with people like you and welcome you guys on the podcast because you guys deserve all the respect, all the love, all the praise in the world for what you do and how you make the the world a better place through your heart and your creativity and your passion and your talent. Yes, sir. So um, a big part of why I do this is to give people a platform to showcase their work and their talent, but also to give them the love and respect and the props that they, deser- they deserve. So we do. I, I appreciate that. And, you know, part of why we do our, our show is called Purple Musicology. Right. Yep. And uh, the the reason that we do that is, number one, because number one, it just feels so good to play Prince's music and, and have people receive it the way they do when you can play it at a high level. Purple musicology, the, the concept of that is that we are basically students. As a musician, I'm a student. As a singer, I'm a student. The the even these these gentlemen that that I play with who are so you know highly accomplished at music uh, uh, as musicians, you know, um, when you talk about Michael Bland, when you talk about Levi and, and Sonny T and the and Prince, you know, it's like people are like, oh, okay. All right, I got to step my game up this night. We're still students of of those greats. And um, so that's why we call it Purple Musicology, because we are uh, still studying the art form and the music that Prince um, created. And uh, we are trying to recreate it live on stage. Um, And I'll tell you, you know, one of the things that I missed and and was so sad about when, when Prince passed is there was nothing like you know, without a drink, without a drug, being in the audience at a Prince concert and feeling that euphoric kind of high from the music and the the high level of entertainment and musicianship that that you were able to experience when you were at one of Prince's concerts. And, you know, selfishly, you know, for me, I'm somewhat trying to create that on stage with the high, highest level of musicians for my own selfish need just to if I can sing it really well and the band can play it really well and we're enjoying it with Prince's fans there's there's no better feeling um than that it doesn't quite replace you know being at the Welcome to America tour or the Prince Time Vanity 1999 era tour or the Love Sexy tour or the new tour nothing will replace those those moments in my in my life, but uh, you know, this is something that we can do to to celebrate um, what Prince gave to us. Hey, you know, bottom line is, you know, Prince has has moved on to a new phase of of existence, and and we're here. Yes. Um, in my in my way of thinking, you know, it's up to it's up to us, the fans, to carry the torch. You know, keep the legacy going, keep the fire burning, as it were, and and uh, talent, talented musicians like yourself and so many others. You know, we have to do what we can to keep the keep the flame burning. You know, keep the keep the spirit alive, keep the legacy alive. So, yes, um, absolutely. So yeah, I have tremendous respect. And tremendous love for everybody who's who's kept the legacy alive, not only through music but through, you know, academic work and analysis in that arena. And you know, um, people have written written books. I've had the great Dwayne Tudal, a friend of mine, on the podcast several times, who's written um, a couple of great books on. Prince's studio sessions. Dwayne is is one of those persons that has really done a great job to further the legacy of of Prince. You know, after his passing. So yeah. there's there's so many talented people like that in all different kinds of arenas, and I have tremendous respect and tremendous love for for everyone who 
who uses their skills and their passions and their talents to, um, you know, keep the memory alive of this yeah. great yeah. art, great artist, you know, in, and great human being. So, and in my opinion, too, it's like we have to, um, we have to keep doing this because number one, we have to do our best to introduce Prince's music to the younger generation so that, you know, it doesn't phase out, you know, with, with our demographic. Um, and one of the most wonderful experiences that I was able to have um, where I saw so many young people um, in the audience was back in, in, in 2019, um, I got that dream call and uh, was able to go out and as a guest vocalist and perform with Prince's band with the new power generation. And um, we did, uh, we did London, we did Manchester, the U UK, we did New Orleans, we did, um, uh, where was it in uh, Arizona, um, Chandler, Arizona. And, um, you know, just to get that call from my musical idols and, you know, show up to sound check and, you know, I'm like, that's Sonny T behind me. That's, oh. that's Leafly. <laughs> <I mean, laughs> oh, just mind blowing, man. And yeah. You know, yeah. So I hope that they go out and do it again, man, because I saw, you know, more, more young people in the audience, um, you know, that were able to enjoy, um, Prince's music at, at a high level. And I think it's just, you know, it's crucial to keep, you know, for everybody that was involved in Prince and those, you know, who can um, do his music at a, at a, at a high level uh, to keep, keep going, you know, keep doing it um, and, and make sure that his music and uh, his, uh, his, the, the feeling of his music just lives on. Definitely, definitely. And that's what, that's what Purple Night, the Purple Nights podcast has been about ever since Prince's passing. You know, there was a period of, there was a period there in 2016 where in my grief, I contemplated, you know, giving it up. But I thought, you know. Um, More important than ever now. Yeah, yeah. It's it's too important. Uh, there's There's so much left to be said. There's so much left to be learned about the the depth of his artistry and his talent and and the reverberations of inspiration and creativity that that still reverberate today and will you know yes for, sir for the rest of time as far as i'm concerned so there are, there are people still discovering prince's greatness you know what i mean people coming up and guitarists you know, who are studying and it's like, they know that Prince is one of the, one of the greatest of all time. And, um, you know, we need, we need to keep it that way. And the only way to do that is to make sure his music is heard and his music is played, especially live, you know? Yes. Yes. So what are, what are some of the things you've got coming up? You mentioned the, the gig, and the gig in LA coming up. Yeah. That's the... April 21st. And then the night before celebration kicks off in Minneapolis on June 19th I'll be performing at the Purple Genealogy kickoff party um so the ladies from Purple Genealogy that's a, another kind of a, a fan group and they have a fantastic event real classy event um they do it at the women's club um in in Minneapolis and so I'll be performing at that we had a great time last year and I didn't perform last year I just went as a as a party goer and this year I'll be, I'll be performing. So it's usually just a DJ, you know, um, and they just party hard and they have, you know, um, costumes, contests, and uh, it's just, a, you know, it's just a great way to, to socialize with everybody who's there for celebration. Then of course I'm going to celebration. I'm not missing that this year. So I will be, I will be at celebration. Um, and then um, come up, uh, August, I'll be with Alfonso Starr at the uh, Love Sexy Cruise Around the Bay. Um, and that's August 3rd. That takes off from um, uh, 
uh, the the uh, it's, well, it's 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 takes off in San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, yeah, so those it's kind of purple season, man. So I'm looking forward to everything uh, Prince related that's uh, that's coming up. And I'm still working on a new album. And I've got some new uh, music that I've uh, that I finished. One thing that I, I recently did that I'm going to release. I recently finished it. I should say I started a while ago, but I did. Um, I remember, you know, Prince always said, you know, if you're going to create music, you know, try to do what everyone else is not doing. Right. Right. And so me being a vocalist, um, there was a time, especially in the 90s, when acapellas were, you know, um, very, very, uh, they were on radio. Like you don't hear acapellas on radio anymore. You don't really hear too many, you know, all all vocal songs um right. boys to men shy portrait you know um all for one for um had so in love and those records did really really well so i okay so i, I say that all to say that um i'm also a big alexander o'neill fan <laughs> and yep. uh jam of course and yep. um on um on Alex's album, um, there was a, a song called, or it was his, my favorite album of his, um, there was a song called Sunshine. So um, I have done an all acapella remake of Sunshine. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it was, it's kind of me kind of imagining like if I were four different singers, right? Oh. Um, and wow. blending my is like like I was still in Color Me Bad, like I was singing uh -huh. with all from Boys to Men or sure, or something. Sure. Like that. So I've done an all acapella remake of uh, of Sunshine. So I'm going to be putting that out um, very very soon. Um, and I've got a uh, hope Jam Lewis don't mind. I got the compulsory license to to do that. Um, you know, I would love for them to be involved in it, but uh, you know, I'm not that right. big time. Right, well <laughs> but. Where can people find you on social media? Oh, well, okay. So um, on Instagram, um, it's my first name, last name, Martin underscore Kember on Instagram. Of course, I'm on Facebook. It's just forward slash Martin Kember. Um, and uh, I don't really do too much Twitter or X as they call it now. Yeah. Um you know, my daughter's on Snapchat. I am on TikTok, you know. <laughs> you can just look up Martin Kember, K-E-M-V-E-R on TikTok. Um, my daughter made sure I got on TikTok, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, so, um, and you know, I'm uh, I'm constantly just, uh, you know, networking with people, uh, particularly on on Facebook, because there's so many of these purple groups that are on, on Facebook. So, uh, you yeah. know, I, I'm just connecting and, and networking um, with everybody there. Thank you so much, Martin, for uh, taking the time, taking the time, giving me your time, and uh, absolutely talking with me a little bit tonight. And it's it's very nice to formally talk to you. I know we met briefly in passing, but um, it's nice to finally connect and engage in conversation with you. And and you're such a a talented artist, sure, but more importantly than that, you're a good human being, and that radiates Appreciate from you. So, likewise. likewise. So, for myself and Martin Kember, I'd like to say thank you all for watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and as we go out, we're going to play just a little bit of Martin Kember's cover of Alexander O'Neill's Sunshine, so with that, until next time, peace and be wild, everybody. She touched me with a smile that glows, and I can't go a day without my sunshine. Shine, my sunshine turns to rain.